Thank you all for joining us tonight. Left Bank Books is presenting leading sociologist, celebrated author, and Washington University professor, Adia Hardy Wingfield, to discuss her new book, Gray Areas, How the Way We Work Perpetuates Racism and What We Can Do to Fix It. Tonight's event is possible because of your support. When you support Left Bank Books, your money goes directly into the local economy. It keeps our bookstore open. It also keeps your streets paved, your libraries funded, and your parks free, and all the other wonderful things that make St. Louis such a beautiful place to live. Thank you all for supporting and shopping local tonight. <laughs> we also want to welcome our virtual audience joining us tonight. And my name is Elena Hove, and I'm a bookseller here at um, Left Bank Books and a junior event host. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about another event we have coming up. Uh, this upcoming Monday, October 30th, we will be hosting Margaret Rankle to discuss her new book, The Comfort of Crows, A Backyard Year, which will be at 6 p.m. at the Schlafly Library. And you can check our event calendar on our website, left-bank.com, to see all of our full list of programming, which is for readers of all ages. And so I want to make sure we have so much time to talk about the book tonight, so I'm just going to read a small quote from Ibram X. Kendi, who's was about this book that this is vital work. It's important for anyone committed to dismantling racism. And then I'm going to talk about the author. <laughs> <laughs> so Adia Harvey Wingfield is a leading sociologist and celebrated author who researches racial and gender inequality in professional occupations. Dr. Wingfield is the Mary Towson Hemingway Professor of Arts and Sciences and Vice Dean for Faculty Development and Diversity at Washington University here in St. Louis. She served as president of Sociologists for Women in Society and the Southern Sociological Society. Her last book, Flatlining, Race, Work, and Healthcare in the New Economy, won the 19 or the 2019 C. Wright Mills Award from the Society for the Study of Social Problems. She writes regularly for mainstream outlets, including Slate, The Atlantic, and Vox. And she lives here in St. Louis, Missouri. I'm going to turn it over to Adia. Thank you for that nice introduction. I'm going to stall for a minute because I saw some familiar faces. <laughs> so I'll slowly open the book <laughs> and let uh, people filter in. <laughs> Great. So thanks, everybody, for coming. It's exciting to have the chance to talk about gray areas tonight. And this is actually my first public discussion of the book. So I hope you all don't mind. Uh, being the, the premier audience for me talking a little bit about what's in here. So what I would like to do tonight um, is to alternate basically between reading and a little bit of talking about the background of the book and the ideas behind it and the things that went into it. Uh, I try to write as accessibly as possible, but it's not a novel, so I can't just straight read from it without, I think, you all getting bored. But I do want to include a couple of sections that I think are interesting and then talk, as I said, about uh, some of the ideas behind them in the context for why I chose these particular passages. So I'm going to start with the introduction. On March 6, 2016, I opened my work email to find a message with the subject line, go to Africa if you don't like America, you retarded me. The sender was anonymous, a stranger who felt compelled to inform me in the body of the email that white lives matter way more than you stupid monkeys do. For variety, he, added, he tossed in an additional racist slur, then closed with several lines chanting USA, followed by strings of text laughter. I was surprised to see the email. It wasn't at all what I was expecting when I opened my inbox, but I also felt curiously detached from the sender's jeering taunts. I had a feeling I knew why I was being targeted that day. I'd recently written an op-ed piece for Fortune magazine considering how the Black Lives Matter movement would impact workplaces going forward, and guessed that the sender was, rather inarticulately, expressing disagreement with my conclusions. <laughs> this wasn't the first email I'd gotten from an irate stranger contacting me out of the blue to offer their unsolicited opinion of me, my research, and Black people in general. I usually see an uptick in these kinds of messages if I recently appeared on a podcast, spoken on public radio, or written an op-ed. Usually the messages are lengthy, riddled with typos, and brimming with visceral rage and hostility, and they usually also go right into my trash folder without a second thought. But this one came on the heels of several others with similar content and tone, so I passed them on to my university's public safety office in case this was the beginning of a more sustained and threatening harassment campaign. And then I deleted the messages. 
getting the email was not ideal. I'd obviously prefer not to receive racist hate mail. But at the time, I was more focused on whether it was possible to report it to campus security in a way that would establish a record in case the sender escalated things, but that wouldn't create additional problems for me as an employee. Eventually, I did discuss the situation with a few colleagues. When I sent the message to campus safety, they contacted our head of IT, who offered me his apologies and wanted to let me know they had a record of what happened. He also told my department chair, who notified the dean, to ensure this was on her radar as well. But I didn't really expect anything to happen. And they all confirmed that there wasn't much anyone could do to track down the offender. We didn't discuss whether receiving racist hate email compromised my ability to do my job, or whether the university had resources available to assist faculty affected by incidents like these. Luckily, the messages never escalated to the point of outright threats. I never felt in any physical danger, and the senders never followed up. I presume they stood in their own fury for a while, and then directed their energy elsewhere, maybe toward finding the next Unite the Right rally, or brushing up on great replacement theories. But my experience is illustrative of a couple of things. One is that for many black workers today, racism is not a relic of the past. It is not tangential. It is a core part of the black experience, front and center in ways that elude even the most, frequently elude even the most well-meaning white coworkers. The second point is that because these racial issues are so entrenched, dealing with them can be difficult. It requires copious amounts of time, energy, and effort. But much of that labor falls solely on black employees in ways that are overlooked and ignored because most companies aren't fully prepared to address these dynamics. Instead, black workers figure out on their own how to manage everything from over-harassment to race to cumulative microaggressions. Which factors lead to these scenarios and what this book will explore is why work remains a site where race, where, excuse me, why work remains a site where race is central and where black workers bear the brunt of that reality. Because despite efforts to construct it as such, work isn't a neutral and biased sphere driven solely by economic production. Rather, work has always been a mechanism for maintaining racial equality, and, as, and key aspects of work, from getting a job, to establishing workplace norms, to advancement and mobility, were usually not built with black workers in mind. This means that in a modern era, when many organizations experiment with diversity programming and profess a commitment to principles of inclusion, their efforts in these current iterations are destined to fail. So I want to stop there uh, just for a moment and note that I've talked a little bit about some of the uh, more personal aspects of this work, but this has been driven by a lot of professional uh, thoughts and interests of mine as well. I've spent most of my career researching these questions related to race and gender and inequality in the workplace, and particularly when it comes to race and inequality in the workplace, a lot of that has come from a professional interest in a paradox that drives a lot of the research I do. And that paradox comes from the fact that when we look at the course of American history, we are over 50 years after the Civil Rights Act of 1964 that outlawed legal discrimination in workplaces and other aspects of American life. Since about the 90s to 2000s, we've also seen the growth of an enormous diversity industry that now is a multi-billion multi -billion dollar industry in American workplaces. But at the same time, we also know that there remain significant and pronounced systemic inequalities in our workplaces. We know, for example, that racial discrimination at the point of hiring, uh, according to a study from the Proceedings from the National Academy of Sciences in 2018, has remained virtually unchanged since the 1980s. We know that black workers are likely to stall out at middle management levels. We know that they are likely to experience pronounced wage inequality that isn't eradicated by educational attainment. And we know that black workers are significantly underrepresented in leadership roles in corporate America. So to me, that begs the question of why all those things are happening. Why do we see such intentional legislative progress coupled with such inertia and inability to see the results of that progress translate into actual representative demographic shifts? And that question has really animated the crux of my research since I was a graduate student and came out of graduate school. All of my research projects, whether focused on black men in uh, male-dominated occupations or black workers in the healthcare industry or black workers near emotional performance in workplaces, all of it has been driven by trying to understand this question better. And so what I offer in gray areas is the idea and the argument that what I refer to as these gray areas of work are a critical part of why we see these inequalities continuing to persist. So when I talk about this idea of gray areas, what I'm referring to are the parts of work that are related to but not endemic to the basic parameters of our job descriptions. So my job is to be a college professor. That requires me to do research, teaching, often more service than I think I should be doing, but that's, <laughs> a, different conversation. <laughs> that's a different conversation. But if you look at my job contract, it specifies that research, teaching, and service are what I'm supposed to do for work. But there's a lot of other stuff that goes along with my job also. There's the requirement to build social networks and connections with other colleagues in the field, particularly if I'm interested in landing jobs and moving into other opportunities. There's understanding organizational culture and having a better sense of what the organizational culture looks like in a workplace and making sure that I'm operating within that context. 
And then there's also the importance of navigating relationships and developing relationships with Spencer, with, me, with sponsors, mentors, and people who are really critical if advancement is something that you're interested in. And so when I talk about the gray areas of work, I'm not talking about the parts of your job that are the core parts that are in the contract like I described. I'm talking about the social, cultural, and relational parts of work that are, again, a part of everyone's job, but are also usually a bit more ambiguous, almost always unregulated, and therefore a site for a lot more opportunity for racial inequality to persist. And so this is what I spell out in the book. And I do this by referring to the experiences of seven different respondents um, and focusing on the three sections that I just described. The respondents in the book are people who span a variety of different uh, workplaces and experiences. I talked to uh, a black woman, Constance, who's a chemical engineer at a research university. I talked to Alex, who is mostly doing gig work at the moment. There's Kevin, who is a nonprofit worker. Brian, who is a film producer. Um, Amalia, who's a journalist, Max, who's an emergency medicine doctor, and Darren, who's a vice president uh, in a corporate finance job. And the idea behind here was to make sure that I had a breadth of industries that I could pull from in talking about black workers, but also to give, again, a, a, some continuity and to show how these gray areas related to the social, cultural, and relational parts of our job have different implications for workers across all of these sectors, but still ultimately really work to create opportunities where their, their chances for mobility and their ability to really thrive in the workplaces where they are hired are often adversely affected by these gray areas that are part of our workplaces. So with that said, I want to read a little bit from the section on uh, constants. And this is the part that talks about the cultural aspects of gray areas. And so here in this section, I focus on organizational culture. Constance's work experiences in academia reflect these contradictions, reflect contradictions. Petite and caramel skin with a neatly braided hairstyle and a quiet, serious demeanor. She has a bit of a protective shell to her that I suspect comes from many years as the lone black woman in professional spaces. She works as a professional, excuse me, as a professor of chemical engineering at one of the top research universities in the country. Chemical engineers have access to enormous labs and complicated looking stainless steel equipment that I find both confusing and intimidating. <laughs> Given that the extent of my own knowledge of chemistry peaked in an 11th grade high school class, I was not at all clear about the particulars of what went on in her lab and realized to my former chemistry teacher's disappointment, I'm sure, that all I remember from that class is what a Bunsen burner is and does. <laughs> but these are far more comfortable spaces for Constance, who told me about some of her current projects in terms simple enough that I almost understood what she was talking about. For my part, I resisted the urge to reference the television show Breaking Bad and its main character, a high school chemistry teacher who builds a crystal meth empire, because I suspected this might not be the time or place to make Heisenberg. <laughs> As a chemical engineer, Constance is not housed in one of the units where her colleagues are likely to engage in research or teaching related to race. Most of her department colleagues, like her, are scientists who focus on the natural world of metals, particles, and chemicals. Yet departmental norms and politics encourage teamwork and collaboration, particularly between faculty and graduate student researchers, and between faculty who can work together to produce results. Uh, this, this could be construed as a clan culture, where employees are encouraged to foster ties and connections, make decisions by general consensus, and communicate effectively. But despite this clan culture, Constance's department does not engage in much discussion of matters of race or pay attention to the kinds of challenges that black students or faculty might encounter. And this is not to say that departments in the natural sciences are necessarily able to develop a culture free from bias. Black students are disproportionately underrepresented in the natural sciences, and those who do enter this field report exclusion, stereotyping, and being pushed out by faculty and student peers who don't believe they belong or are suited to a rigorous environment characterized by advanced math and science skills. Perceptions of this field as being very white and male discourage students from pursuing careers. The data-driven technical world of the sciences is still one in which the content, con excuse me, the culture can be alienating for black students. In that context, Constance's departmental culture is largely race blind. Colleagues prefer to focus on their scientific endeavors, publications, and attempts to secure external funding, and the culture valorizes efforts to achieve these metrics and conduct top quality research. But Constance still encounters difficulties that seem directly related to her position as a black woman in this setting. She has had undergraduate students openly speculate that she doesn't understand her own research, colleagues who ignore her when she sees them on campus, and proposal reviews that reflect clear racial and gender bias. In a department where the norm is to avoid talking about race or racism, however, these issues go unnoticed. Constance remarked that most of her departmental colleagues refuse even to acknowledge the openly racist teaching evaluation she received or the casual stereotyping she encountered from peers. They were oblivious to the stonewalling and general uninterest she faced when trying to establish the collaborative relationships that are necessary for scientists in her field. She noted with frustration, you can't go and complain about racism every time something happens. It's bad because nobody's going to believe you. They want proof. And then when you tell people what happens to you, they want to tell you how it wasn't racist. 
They're not going to experience your perspective, so there's no point in going down that road. For Constance, this dynamic of knowing full well that racism impedes her while colleagues implacably refuse to re recognize this fact is disorienting and unsettling. She's positive that her department's culture overlooks the racial biases that make it harder for her to thrive and succeed in her job. But having this experience doubted and ignored is infuriating. As a result, Constance often second guesses herself. Other times she struggles to identify when and how her own personality quirks, being somewhat shy, introverted, and at times uncomfortable speaking up, are an issue and when racial and gender bias is at fault. She doesn't doubt her grasp of the science and the leg legitimacy of her ideas, but she does face an ongoing challenge of trying to fit into a workplace that, because of its gray areas, isn't so hospitable to black women. And by being mired in colorblind discourse, the organizational culture at her university only aids in perpetuating this. So I may read a little bit more of Constance's uh, narrative, but I want to first say why I felt that it was important to include her. I wanted to make sure that I included someone in STEM fields, just because the tech industry and STEM fields are so significant and so major a factor in our current uh, workplaces and our current um, uh, industry landscape. But I felt that it was also important to include Constance because she works at a university. And I think when we think about cultures and organizational culture, universities certainly have this perspective of being these liberal environments and these liberal enclaves that are progressive and forward thinking and these real leaders on, on race and race related issues. Uh, so I wanted to include Constance's remarks because they present some interesting dynamics to that question. And the reason I say that is that Part of what's occurring at Constance's university is that her university does purport to take these issues of diversity very seriously. I think some of her colleagues might actually be surprised to see just how alienated and isolated she feels in this workplace. There's an office, as there are at most universities, devoted to these issues of diversity and inclusion. There are numerous people whose titles involve working on these types of related uh, issues and, and, um, and problems. Uh, but when I talked with Constance a little bit more about what that's meant in manifesting, uh, what, how that's been manifested in her department, she made some interesting comments. She told me, uh, she made an offhand comment about having lunch of groups of women who were part of her department and the alienation she felt with those women. And now I'm going back to the book. When we spoke, I found it particularly interesting. She mentioned that some of the discussions where she engaged in her masquerades in car occurred with a group of women from the engineering department. This struck me because of the well-documented gender disparities in STEM fields. In processes that parallel those of men of color, women of all races in STEM fields face a multitude of challenges. Repeated pressure to prove their competence, the difficulty of combating gendered stereotypes of incompetence without appearing aggressive, cold or unfriendly, dealing with sexual harassment, and coping with exclusion and isolation. So I was curious about how her department got to a point where it included more than one woman, a total of seven, but she remained the only black faculty member. And so she explained to me, my dean decided they wanted to hire women. So guess what? They hired five women in one year. It was that simple. You can make these kinds of changes if you want to. They just don't want to when it comes to getting black people. People will say, oh, we need to hire women. That's okay, maybe even admirable. But no one person, not one person will say, oh, we need to hire black people. That never happens. So I include that because it underscores some of the issues related to race-blind organizational cultures and what they can mean for black women like Constance in these environments. She is at a place where the organizational culture uh, is one that is very much encouragement and in encouragement and support of faculty working together. But the race-blind nature of the organization and the organizational culture means that colleagues are often unaware of or oblivious to the types of challenges that are present for black women workers like Constance. Additionally, and this happens in a lot of organizations, when companies do try to uh, take a focus and make some attention to diversity, we know from the research that a lot of what happens is that attention to diversity often shifts to become a more gender focus on diversity. And that the result of that often is that there becomes more of a commitment to uh, addressing gender and talking about gender issues in ways that may often benefit white women, but not necessarily women of color like Constance. And that's exactly what happened to her. She found herself in this situation where, uh, as is consistent with the shift away from affirmative action towards diversity, and I'll go back to the book now, companies are often less attuned to the specific particular challenges that their black employees face. For black women workers like Constance, this is underscored by the unique bind in which she finds herself. On one hand, the dean of her college is quite comfortable drawing attention to the issues women face in engineering and moving decisively to address this by hiring more women. But for black women like Constance, that solves only part of the problem. Even in the company of a relatively large number of women faculty in her department, Constance still feels isolated and ignored. She struggles to figure out when and where she can change and when that change needs to come from the university. When the organizational culture of a workplace is one in which dealing with the complexities around racial diversity are taboo or peripheral, uh, 
wow, I just lost my place. Even diversity efforts that garner <laughs> some success on other fronts will leave out black workers. So as I mentioned, I think Constance is important to include here for these reasons. She gives us a sense of organizational culture and the ways in which colorblind organizational cultures can really do a lot of damage for black workers. But she also gives us some insights into how black women workers experiences are particularly nuanced and affected by organizational approaches that focus on diversity writ large, but without necessarily the targeted approach to thinking more specifically about how different groups may be adversely affected by existing culture. But what about how we find our jobs in the first place? And this becomes the second part of the book. I focus here on what I refer to as the social aspects of gray areas. And these talk about the networks and the connections that are critical and important for how we move into hiring. The reason I focus on uh, social aspects here is because our research, is, research has shown that for many black workers, or for many workers at large, the ways that people often find work today have shifted a lot over decades. This is not, we don't live in the old kind of model anymore where you might see a help wanted ad in a window and <coughs> inquire about a job or even see job ads in the classifieds because there aren't newspapers anymore. <laughs> so this idea of finding work that way is fairly obsolete. In fact, today most workers find uh, opportunities and find access or find out about jobs by virtue of their social networks and their connections. And on the face of it, that might seem pretty straightforward. But the issue that arises with relying on social networks as a, uh, as a factor for hiring is that often our networks are not very racially integrated. Uh, so back to the book, uh, job seekers are likely to rely on friends, neighbors, casual acquaintances, or classmates for leads on work, but often these circles themselves are racially segregated. A 2014 study from the Public Religion Research Institute reported that approximately 75% of whites had no people of color in their close friend networks. This imbalance evokes comedian Chris Rock's joke in a 2009 stand-up routine that all my black friends have a bunch of white friends, and all my white friends have one black friend. <laughs> <laughs> the data suggests that Chris Rock's experience is actually not that unique. Uh, in this context, it's not hard to see how using social networks as a core part of the hiring process can be a mechanism for perpetuating racial inequality at work. When managers rely on networks, referrals, and tips from employees, current friends, or colleagues to determine who makes it through the hiring process, it is also likely that they will be drawn from largely homogenous circles. So I bring this up as the kind of backdrop for a lot of what I talk about in the, the second section. This reliance on relationships and networks has become a really critical part of our hiring, but it explains also why a lot of uh, wanted um, uh, approaches to trying to create more diversity in workplaces, again, don't work. We can think, for example, of the Rooney Rule in the NFL, the idea that co coaches are, or that uh, team owners are mandated to hire at least one black coach if they're making, uh, sorry, mandated to interview at least one black uh, applicant if they're making a decision about hiring. But we also know from the data that that has not actually resulted in an influx of black coaches and head coaching positions. In fact, I think about um, a significant, uh, in the nearly 20 years since the Rooney Rule was implemented, 13 of the 32 teams in the NFL, nearly half, have never had a black coach in a full-time role. So some of that has to do with the fact that the rule was not implemented, but a lot of it also, we know, has to do with the fact that if people are drawing from their existing networks and connections to make decisions about hiring and a policy has no implementation, then bringing someone else into the hiring uh, circuit doesn't necessarily do much if they're already making a decision to draw from their existing place. It can lead to uh, legal action, as we've seen firsthand happening in the NFL, but not necessarily an improvement or an uptake in who actually has jobs. So some of you might be thinking, well, okay, yes, networks matter a lot, but what about the way that our workplaces have changed? What about the ways that access to various jobs have changed in, again, this technological era where we have a variety of different apps, and if you're interested in it, you can just download an app and go find work that way. Those don't require access to social networks. Pretty much anybody can get a job if you want to uh, have the opportunity to drive for Uber or uh, Airbnb your house or something like that. Those are opportunities, right? So if you're thinking that, I have a chapter for you. <laughs> because I made a point to talk to Alex, who is a gig worker that I interviewed. I mentioned Alex before. She has primarily been uh, driving for uh, Uber Eats for about the last, it would have been about two years by the time the book went to press. And in Alex's situation, she had held a number of uh, different jobs before moving into that role. She uh, had worked uh, at in retail jobs. She had also worked uh, as a contractor in an airport job uh, with a company that 
But she lost that job in 2020. We all remember what happened in 2020. So you can figure Lost that job in 2020 when the job downsized as a result of uh, the airline industry cratering temporarily as a result of uh, COVID and everything that happened. And so when she lost that job, she turned to gig work as a way of moving into something quickly that would allow her to meet her needs and meet her financial responsibilities. So despite its defenders' claims, however, that gig work allows contractors to make as much or as little as they want, the reality is more complicated. Company policies make it hard for many workers to subsist on these earnings alone. For instance, frequent changes to the rules for driver payment rates or service fees can mean that contractors earn less for their work. Additionally, platforms deduct a percentage of contractors' earnings, which can make it difficult for them to earn enough to live on, especially in cities with a high cost of living. When these dynamics are factored in, it becomes clear that even though gig work provides a means of employment that doesn't rely on extensive social networks, that work is not necessarily very lucrative and can, in fact, be exploitative and taxing. This argument challenges one of the main selling points about the gig economy, that workers can decide how much they want to earn. Even Alex cited this is one of the advantages that led her to Uber Eats and Postmates. She controls her schedule, the jobs pay her bills, and she can work more and presumably earn more if she wants to. But studies have shown that the way many companies calculate wages makes this extremely difficult, if not impossible, for workers to subsist on gig work full time. More commonly, gig workers are strugglers who face an uphill battle making ends meet, or strivers who do gig work to supplement their incomes and earn extra cash. Thus, when it comes to finding work without relying on networks, Alex is relegated to a sector of the economy that purports to offer more financial security than it actually provides. Although gig jobs are available without networks, they are also not likely to offer solid benefits. Some companies do provide such perks to workers, but they do so very selectively into highly skilled jobs and empl highly skilled employees and jobs that usually require connections to land. Netflix, for instance, offers salaried workers a year, full year off at full pay after birth or adoption of a child, and Airbnb provides birth mothers with 22 weeks of paid leave. Given that the United States is the only high-income country not to offer paid parental leave, even significantly poorer countries such as the Democratic Republic of the Congo and Afghanistan offer this very basic benefit, this is a particularly notable provision because companies aren't legally obligated to offer anything and many companies provide no paid leave as a result. Consequently, many new mothers return to work within a few weeks of giving birth despite the health risks, stress, and emotional exhaustion this causes. In most cases, they don't do this because they feel up to it or they just love their jobs that much. No one has ever fixed postpartum sleep deprivation by going back to work. <laughs> they do it because they can't afford not to. These policies thus generate laudatory responses and no doubt help to attract top job candidates, but they are also far less expansive than may be immediately apparent. These benefits apply to salary workers who are directly employed by Netflix or Airbnb, their executives, managers, or other high-level earners. In a fissured workplace, policies like these leave out contractors who take on much of the less glamorous work that allows companies to function. Contract work certainly does not provide extensive paid family leave policies. It doesn't guarantee workers' compensation, unemployment insurance, or paid leaves of any kind. In the predominantly white tech industry, the workers who are directly employed at these companies benefit from the opportunity to balance parenthood and work, bond with children, and for those who have given birth, recover from that physical experience. The black employees are usually underrepresented among this group, which means they aren't as eligible for these gener generous benefits. To put it in stark terms, the women, mostly white, who do coding or software design get the paid time off to bond with their children. But the black women who clean their offices or cook the food in the cafeteria, they get none of these perks. Instead, they figure out how to pay for childcare and they go back to work. This variation in how companies treat certain classes of workers is a major factor driving racial and economic inequality today. A team of economists studying this issue estimated that nearly 66% of the explosion in income inequality from 1978 to 2012 is a result of these disparities between firms, the ones that selectively rely on networks and connections to employ workers who get significant pay, perks, and benefits, and the ones that offer none of those things. This is economic inequality today, and given how underrepresented black workers are in the elite jobs, it has a decidedly racial tinge to it. Ultimately, Alex's account shows that while social networks are a central mechanism for hiring today's knowledge-based tech-driven economy, there are ways that black workers can subvert this process. Those who forego networks entirely can still find work, but that work tends to be more precarious, uncertain, and lower wage. Black workers like Alex can use the gig economy to sidestep the gray areas associated with hiring, but that path rarely leads them to stable, lucrative employment. So clearly, I've, made, I've tried to make the point here that uh, this Focus and this connection on networks and relationships is driving a lot of our work and a lot of our opportunities for work. It doesn't have to necessarily drive every uh, road that people have to employment, but when we look at the roads and the options that are available without access to connections and the networks that can result in uh, access to what we might think of as the better jobs, 
the results are more likely to look like what Alex described. They are not necessarily likely to be anywhere near as prestigious or to offer the same level of economic security and stability. So the last person that I'll turn to is uh, Brian. And Brian is useful for thinking about this question of advancement. Uh, and this is, as I mentioned, a thing that's really been a key part of what I think about a lot professionally in terms of why we see black workers so underrepresented, particularly in high status uh, leadership roles and professional occupations and so forth. And a lot of what I talk about in the preview to this section has to do with the role of mentors and sponsors and the way that mentors and sponsors are really critical in offering people pathways and opportunities towards moving into leadership roles. But again, because this uh, idea of I, this, because this idea of advancement uh, is often opaque and the expectations and criteria for moving into leadership roles are often not necessarily made explicitly clear, the role that mentors and sponsors can play is often outsized, but it's often outsized in ways that disproportionately disadvantage black workers who report that they are less likely than other racial groups to have access to or close relationships with people who are their supervisors or their managers. So I turn to Ryan, who works in the film industry, as I mentioned, out similarly construed as a very progressive uh, industry and more of a forward thinking, more liberal type of uh, place to get his view on his opportunities for moving into leadership role, roles in the company where he was employed. So again, from the book, when it comes to advancement and pretty much everything else, Brian doesn't mince words. I left Worldwide Studios when it was made clear that advancement was not in my near future, he told me. The studio had hired him during the period <coughs> when it was focused on improving diversity and representation. He joined the company with optimism and excitement about what the opportunity could bring. Yet Brian described many instances where he had to weigh the studio's stated commitments to diversity against the reality of his actions and he detailed his ongoing journey of trying to determine whether it was serious about making change. He grew increasingly frustrated with the corporate culture that touted its appreciation for innovation, creativity, and loyalty, yet failed to support black filmmakers and executives in ways that would allow them to advance the studio's stated goals. So it was not much of a surprise to me when he told me that a few weeks before our first interview, he'd given his notice. I was curious about the details of his departure. When I questioned him about it, he mentioned two factors that he felt were key in his decision to leave. One was financial. Worldwide Studios did not want to give him a promotion, and as such, he was essentially being asked to take a pay cut because he would not receive the stock options that accompanied a move to senior management. For Brian, being asked to work for less was an untenable situation, as it would be for many employees. The second factor was the opacity surrounding the denied promotion. Brian saw no reason why he was denied promotion that would have ensured commensurate compensation. In fact, he felt that his work more than justified a move up the corporate ladder. And this is a quote from him. As the only executive on the team who had advocated for and been part of the acquisitions team on two different Academy Award nominated movies, and the only executive at this level who had sourced two different movies that had gone into production, I did not know what in my work was not worth promotion. As it turned out, neither did his managers. Though he repeatedly sought feedback about how to improve his performance to ensure his superior supervisor's satisfaction and continuous climb up the career ladder, he faced obfuscation, stonewalling, and undermining. His annual review contained positive written feedback, but he also received notes from other leaders in the firm that he needed improvement. When he tried to clarify where, how, and to what extent he needed to improve, no information was forthcoming. The dearth of feedback is not unusual. One particular challenge many black workers face in trying to advance is the difficulty of getting clear advice, especially when that feedback needs to be constructively critical. This may seem paradoxical, given that other studies have shown that many black workers are treated more harshly and face greater disciplinary action and punishment than their white counterparts. Yet there's a key difference. Black workers are closely scrutinized, making them more likely to be sanctioned and reprimanded for even small mistakes. At the same time, they are much less likely to receive honest, direct feedback about how they can improve performance in a way that enables them to develop and advance. Frequently, this type of feedback is a consequence of white managers' uncertainty about and discomfort with interacting with black employees. Benedict, a, part, a black partner in a prestigious Seattle law firm, shared with me that many colleagues perceive him harshly because he's always direct and pointed with junior black colleagues about areas where they need to improve. <coughs> he's relentlessly critical of their writing skills, demands perfection in oral arguments, and insists that they do whatever it takes ethically to meet his high expectations. But Benedict told me that he operates this way because he sees the differences in how white partners demand excellence and high performance from white associates, but then fail to convey these expectations to their black counterparts. For Brian, after a period of time, it became too late for Worldwide Studios to take a route to improvement. He spent enough time grappling with the question of whether the company's commitment to diversity was real or pretend, and he felt that he had his answer. Though Worldwide Studios did many of the right things, the gray areas of work revealed to him that it was not going to be the place that he hoped it could be. Working at a studio where he believed that senior management denied him a promotion he felt that he earned was a non-starter. 
and his belief that his advancement was derailed at least partially because of his vocal support for black filmmakers, despite the studio's public advocacy for racial equity, helped persuade him that it was time to take his talents to South Beach, proverbially speaking. When he failed to receive any information about what improvements he needed to make to advance at Worldwide Studios, he took matters into his own hands. So simultaneously, he told me, I had been in talks with a friend of mine who happens to be a film director of some repute who had directed a movie that received six Oscars. They reached out to see if I wanted to join a new production company. So that is what I've left, and that is where I'm going. It's also worth noting that the production company where Brian is headed is helmed by a person of color. After his frustrating experiences with Worldwide Studios, the opportunity to work with a black producer and give free reign to his commitment to black filmmakers was no small part of the appeal of his new job. Brian felt that his personal and professional goals were more likely to be satisfied in a company that already had diverse leadership at the top, rather than in struggling to break barriers and advance through the ranks of a company that seemed unwilling to offer opportunities. This is a route that may be more available to workers in certain industries or with certain levels of visibility. In fact, Brian's decision to leave Worldwide Studios for a Black-owned production company calls to mind the 2021 controversy and media furor around journalist Nicole Hannah-Jones. Hannah Jones was initially offered a faculty position at University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, but after conservative white board members complained about her scholarship, the university took the highly unusual step of offering her the position without the protection and job security of tenure. After public outcry, the university reversed its decision, but the damage was done. Hannah Jones instead took a position at historically black Howard University, along with fellow MacArthur Foundation Genius Grant winner Ta-Nehisi Coates. For these visible high-status figures, pursuing work away from a, quote, white gaze may be liberating and freeing, particularly when work in predominantly white organizations comes with forward opportunities for mobility, public humiliations, and broken promises. Everyday black workers may find, however, that moving to predominantly black organizations can come with some trade-offs. The peace of mind may be tempered by the fact that black-owned businesses frequently operate with fewer resources and far lower operating budgets than their white counterparts. Often this is a function of wealth disparities in black communities and the fact that black entrepreneurs tend to start businesses with less capital. Even Howard University. Oh no. Serious. Even Howard University, one of the top HBCUs in the country, and now with Hannah Jones and Coates on its faculty, academic home to two of the nation's most well-known black intellectuals had an endowment in 2022 of about 700 million. That might sound impressive until you compare it with the endowment of Harvard University, which that same year was 51 billion, a figure larger than the gross domestic product of several countries. Similar disparities are replicated across many companies and may make it harder, though not impossible, for black owned businesses to secure black talent. So I'll stop there from the reading part and move on to some key points uh, from the conclusion. I think the main thing that I want to say in conclusion is that I have offered these stories from Constance, from Alex, and from Ryan to illustrate this concept of gray areas. The story that I didn't include, though, that I think is important to mention is the account from Darren. And the reason that I include Darren is because he represents, I don't know if I would call him a success story, but he represents a person who works at a company that is doing things that companies can actually do to make improvements in these areas. So Darren, as I mentioned, is the vice president for finance at a uh, major, a vice president at a major financial company. And he talks a lot in his experience about being able to uh, rely on opportunities that the company puts forth for mentoring and to relate to, have opportunities for upward mobility through those connections. He talks about the ways in which he's been able to navigate organizational culture successfully for his ability to thrive in the company and to move forward in the company. And I bring that up not to highlight Darren's experience necessarily, but really to make the point that while I've talked a lot about problems because that's what sociologists do, there are also solutions and there are things that companies and organizations can think about and do differently as a way of trying to address these gray areas. And a lot of this is based on recent research and evidence that documents things that have demonstrated an ability to shift these numbers and to try to erase some of these disparities. These types of things include thinking differently about hiring and recruitment and not necessarily relying so much on existing social networks and the ways that they can replicate biases and inequalities. These involve, rather than uh, involving mandated diversity trainings, putting together diversity task forces for people in an organization who are at different levels of the company. These solutions involve mentoring programs that are open to everybody rather than invitation only or ones that people just uh, opt into because they happen organically. And there are other solutions that I talk about in the book as well, but I think I'm getting close to running out of time, so I won't go into all those. Thank you. Yeah, so there are other um, solutions that are 
that are present and that I discuss. There are other solutions that I discuss in the book as well. And I bring that up again because, um, quite frankly, sociologists can be depressing. And <laughs> you can spend a lot of time talking about problems and things that are wrong. But I want to encourage people to think also about how things can be different. And my hope is that when we look at the bigger picture questions that I've talked about over the course of my own research, this question of why we see these disparities and why we see these differences, these aren't things that had to happen. These are disparities and differences that have occurred because of policy changes and because of organizational decisions and because of inertia or because of an unwillingness to do things that might end up differently. So I really, it would, I, my hope here is that by talking about these issues and these problems and how I see them being present and what the research and the data shows, my hope is that by also talking about some of the data that documents solutions and improvement, that this might be a step forward towards seeing some of these changes so that these gray areas and workplaces become a bit less pronounced. Thank you. I will stop there. Thank you. to a shift in uh, rhetoric and uh, intent from affirmative action conversations to diversity. Could mm -hmm. you expand on that a bit? Yeah, sure. So what we know from kind of this historical long view about how organizations have changed their approach is that in the immediate post-civil rights era, we were likely to see a lot more managers focused on uh, compliance with affirmative action expectations and regulations. So this is where we did see a brief period of time where companies and managers and leaders did think explicitly about addressing racial and gender disparities, specifically in organizations. And given the context of the timing, obviously this makes a lot of sense. This is right after the civil rights movement and that was where the energy and the, the focus was. But researchers have shown that as time progressed and as the political environment began to shift away from that uh, very, um, that particular moment and that particular uh, kind of social energy, what managers started to do to protect themselves and to uh, maintain their position was to focus less on affirmative action that focused explicitly on racial and gender parity and to focus more on diversity writ large. So on the face of it, that might just seem like a semantic difference, but as I try to illustrate with Constance's experience, it's really not that semantic because what we know has happened as a consequence has been that many organizations have defined this idea of diversity so broadly and so widely that it doesn't address uh, systemic issues that are still present in companies. So you can have a person who's a leader in diversity or a diversity manager who might say, well, yes, I'm focused on diversity of thought and diversity of opinion and diversity of region. And technically, yes, you are still focusing on a certain type of diversity, but people with different thoughts and viewpoints are not a protected class. Those aren't groups that are systematically underrepresented across the board in workplaces the same way that women of all races are and that people of color are. And so when I talked about that shift, it was to make, and I talk about this in more, in more detail in the book, but it's to make that point that that transition from affirmative action to diversity had real consequences, and some of those consequences are present for how workers today are now dealing with the cultures and organizations where they're employed. Yes. So how then uh, does having a diversity task force, how does that improve upon the old model of having a diversity office? Or, or, I don't remember exactly what you said. Though. Yes, so that's a great question. So what I was comparing it to was uh, mandated diversity training, which okay. research has yes. shown that's right. very conclusively is not effective yeah. in increasing the numbers of black workers and women of all races at top levels. In fact, it actually can do more damage than yeah. to do more help. But the same research has also shown that when organizations put into place uh, t diversity task forces, that have the support of leadership and that pull from people across the organization and task them with identifying problems in the company but also putting together solutions for those problems, then we're a lot more likely to see people with more investment in it. And there's a couple of reasons why that's the case. For a mandated diversity trainings, these often backfire because uh, white workers feel unfairly or not as if they're being blamed and they get defensive and they just shut down and they don't want to be a part of it. My own research has shown that black workers also may be less invested in diversity training because it feels like regulatory compliance and not necessarily an effort to address the types of things that I've talked about here. But if you have a diversity task force where, again, it has leadership support and people are coming from all different parts of the organization, and the charge for that task force is find out where we have disparities and then put into place some ideas for how we can fix those disparities, 
people are less likely to feel as if they're being singled out or targeted or blamed, and they're more likely to feel like they have opportunities to be part of the solution. And so the data shows that that shift in framing and that shift in the approach actually helps to get people more on board and be more invested. Yes. Would you say also the task force sort of, if they have enough agency or authority that um, then there's more accountability attached to it than sort of like these really sort of amorphous and elusive sort of a, a, a Yes, definitely. And that's part of the other problem with uh, uh, mandated diversity training, right? The way that it often happens um, is that a company will hire someone who's external. They bring in a consultant, they find someone from McKinsey, and <laughs> bring them in, and they come in and they do the seminar, and everybody, not everybody, people often feel irritated because they feel like this is a waste of my time, the company is not serious, they are doing this to make sure they don't get sued or whatever, but this is silly and pointless. The consultant has no loyalty to the company, right? They often are not going to know the ins and outs and the particulars and the culture of the company the same way that people who are internally employed at the company are going to know it, right? And so again, when there is leadership support for and emphasis for really doing this, doing this right, giving people resources, making it a priority, it just lands very differently than your random consultant who's there for a day or two to do a webinar and then leave. Any other questions? Yes. Um, yeah, well, I was uh, curious of your thoughts on, um, I actually heard you on the radio and these, these are coming back to me, but um, what do you think of like the vote that was put out, popular vote, I mean, in Australia for the voice that went down and the, the concept of, you know, retro, retribution and just, you know, uh, some cities and even this country are uh, basically paying back for slavery. And it's not catching, it's not catching fire. I thought we just like, you know, so what happened in Australia? What do you think of that? Yeah, I'm not sure I'm familiar enough with it to have an informed opinion. Can you, can you say more? Uh, they put a referendum, you know, like marijuana. Mm -hmm. And they're like, we want to have the indigenous people have a part of the government where they consult and they have their voice heard and it's called the voice, mm -hmm. yes or no. Mm -hmm. It was defeated. Okay. Yeah, I don't know enough about Australia or Australian <laughs> politics to <laughs> comment on that uh, intelligently. Um, yeah, so I, yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure I don't know enough about the country to say more about why that might have happened or why that might have happened. What you were speaking to uh, on the last question was the concept of having everybody at the table. Mm -hmm. And uh, it seems like we bring it up and then it just fails. And uh, and I'm wondering, the second question was about uh, what do you think of, uh, you know, retribution, restitution, um, efforts that are going into like um, different parts of this country in some cities basically uh, paying back for slavery? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's complicated. I think there's good data and research that does document how long-term systemic disparities have had economic impacts in the United States. I mean, I think there's a lot of work that does show that pretty comprehensively and conclusively. Some of it, a lot of it by sociologists, some of it by people in other, other areas. I guess to, if I were to try to apply the Australia question to the United States, though, I mean, I feel like the parallels would be that I think we'd likely not necessarily see something like that succeed at the, the ballot box, right? And again, I don't want to pretend that I know more about Australian culture and politics than I do, but I do think that we have a long history in the United States of um, not operating in a way where bringing these types of issues, particularly systemic racial issues, through um, voting processes has resulted in real magnified change or real sustained systemic long-term change. Ironically, that actually is one of the things that I think is really interesting about workplaces and organizations, though. I think that we, as Americans, we spend a disproportionate amount of our time at work and working. For many people, this may be the only environment where they do come into contact with people who are significantly different from them, particularly racially different from them. So I actually think that organizations have a really impactful and significant role to play in thinking about how they can construct themselves 
in ways that better reflect the uh, dynamics of our society and address some of these things that I think aren't necessarily completely addressed legislatively. And the other thing related to that is just that uh, when I think about, again, our demographics of our society, I mean, this is an increasingly multiracial society. There are not signs that that's going to be changing or reversing anytime soon. It's just hard for me to imagine how organizations meet the needs of a multiracial democracy uh, in an increasingly multiracial society, unless they are prepared to consider how their workforces can be a better reflection of the communities that they are serving and engaging in. Right now, we don't have that. We have organizations that are operating in a very historical model that doesn't meet the needs of today. So again, it's not quite the political level, but I think it speaks to why it's important to think about what organizations can offer and how they can be somewhat uniquely positioned to address these issues. I've, I've read and heard some of the same things about the failures of diversity interventions, especially mandated ones, especially large companies. That will sound very familiar. Are you familiar at all with the idea of the diversity audit and people coming in, can you tell, tell me what you know about that? Because you just started one. <laughs> yeah, so depending on, I think they're, depending on how those are done, those can give a company some information and data about what the lay of the diversity landscape looks like in a particular company. And I think data, well, I mean, it's not surprising you're a social scientist say this, but data are, it's really useful. It's important to have data. Uh, it's important for companies, I think, to have metrics and measures of what they look like, where they want to go, and to have a clear plan in place for how they're going to get to that, that goal. And that is typical for companies when it comes to most other things, right? It's This is an area where sometimes it becomes more murky and undefined, but in many cases when companies are serious about achieving, an old, uh, achieving a goal, data are collected, numbers are measured, a goal is set, and a plan is put in place for how to get to that point. So I think a diversity audit can be really useful if it's a first step, and if the successive steps are followed by, if the following steps that succeeded are plans to be put in place for how to get to where the company wants to go. Great, right, great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question, if anyone had anything. If not, we can move on to the signing, or? I already asked one, so I can't wait. Okay, that's what, so I'm curious about your first work, how much of your first work, your early book and um, flatlining, informed this work? And then, because uh, you just got published, I mean, this just came out last week. Yeah. But I, so I hate to ask this, but like, where did this, this, this work point you in a, another direction now? Like, make you interested or inspire you to? Pursue the next one. Uh, <laughs> I'm not asking what's next. Yeah, yeah. I probably need a little bit more time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Projects yeah. that are yeah. 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 Um, what Flatlining, it was a little, so typically what's happened with my other projects has been that one has led to the next one yeah. in a pretty clear, kind of linear fashion. So I, what has often happened to me is I finish one project and I think, okay, that's done. Why do you get to talk about this? Mm -hmm. What would happen if this was my question instead of that. Is there anything out there about that? If there's not, then maybe this is an interesting project. So this didn't really proceed from flatlining in the same way. And I think the reason for that was because this always kind of started off um, kind of wider in scope and with the idea of being more of a trade book, trade book and less of an academic book. With flatlining, again, it builds off of several previous projects, but I also really was thinking about trying to understand this one particular industry and how larger economic and cultural changes were having an impact on black workers in an industry that was changing. And so it was a bit more narrowly focused, even though it was looking at workers, uh, di different workers in that particular industry. But this one didn't really come out of finishing flatlining and thinking, okay, I didn't cover that. It was more so, if I wanna talk about something really broad and expansive and reach uh, people, no shade to sociologists, but reach people outside of sociology yeah. and think more about uh, people who might be lay readers, what might be ways to think about these questions that I've been thinking about in a way that could be accessible to, to that audience? So it was, I think, a bit more disconnected from the previous project than most of my other ones have been. Thank you so much, right. Dr. Thank Winfield. You.